When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers to him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they, the Samaritans, did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw that, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> but he turned and rebuked them, and they went on. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, I will follow, I will, no, I will that. He said, uh, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another man, he said, follow me. But that man said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Each gospel has a slightly different focus on the story and person of Jesus. And I've noticed, and you probably will notice too, that at the Church of the Good Shepherd, we like the Gospel of Luke. In Luke, the center of Jesus' ministry is the poor and the disinherited. One of the main focuses is his healing of the sick, forgiving of sinners. Jesus reaches out to marginalized members of society, to the poor, the ill, the tax collectors, the widows and orphans, and the foreigners. Jesus communes with all those who have been excluded. Luke is sometimes referred to as the Gospel of Social Justice, a book where Jesus brings hope and faith to those with whom no one else will interact. And that is the Church of the Good Shepherd, too. We are a community of varied peoples who join in beloved community to worship together and help heal this broken world. I have seen this in the time I have been attending, looking for a place where I could worship and be myself. And we can see it in the mission statement. It's right there in your order of service on the back. I, I would show you, but I left my <laughs> All the stuff is not. <laughs> we welcome all who will come, That's right. and we celebrate the rich diversity of God's people. We affirm the worth of each person, for the walls that divide us are broken down and the wounded find healing. Amen. This church is focused on radical inclusivity and social justice. The offering basket today was a collection for people who were treated unfairly and are in need of assistance. We reach out to those in need. Last Wednesday, as you heard, we came together in a rally celebrating marriage equality. We support those who have been marginalized. So we come to the scripture for today. You can feel a little comfortable. It's Luke. <laughs> probably going to say something about reaching out to love people and being support. And at first it is. First it is. Jesus rebukes his disciples for wanting to call down fire on the Samaritans. I, I can get behind that. I wouldn't wish a fire to destroy anybody. And we appreciate the Jesus who is kind. That's, that's our guy. But what happens next? Yeah. <laughs> the difficult part. The next step. <laughs> Jesus, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you saying here? You thought you were on our side. You're taking it really far. In order to follow you, we can't even bury our dead. We can't say goodbye to those at our house. And as with many preachers, Jesus is talking to himself here too. He is modeling the very thing he is talking about. At this time in Jesus' ministry, he is headed to Jerusalem. Jerusalem 
where he will eventually be arrested and killed. This passage marks the beginning of his journey, where he has set his mind to do what his heart has told him is required. And Jesus uses his own experience to help as an explanation of the high cost of discipleship. Jesus is embodying the cost of discipleship. As he doesn't look back, he moves forward in his difficult, very, very difficult divine calling. The cost of discipleship is high and often countercultural. Hold on, step back a second. What does discipleship even mean? I can ask myself questions and answer them. <laughs> <laughs> discipleship means being a follower, an adherent, a traveler on a path. And this message, as with all messages from that amazing scripture, are bigger than just us. Discipleship isn't only for people who consider themselves Christian or who follow the teachings of Jesus. This message is for all people of all faiths. Discipleship means following our personal and our communal spirituality. Discipleship is recognizing that which is most important in our lives, that which gives our lives meaning and purpose, and living mindfully in support of our higher purpose and meaning. One of my favorite passages in the Bible speaks to living faithfully. And the United Methodist Church on the state of Huron, right downtown, has this verse posted outside of their building. It's from the prophet Micah. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercifully, and to walk humbly with your God. But the Methodist Church downtown leaves out one word which I stress. Your. Your God. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. This is a charge for all people to be true to their own theologies. We need to live our lives in concert with and in support of that which we hold as most dear and important. All of us, whatever our beliefs. And we are an interfaith society. We heard this morning of who we look to for examples. In addition to Jesus, I look to some of these. I personally look to other great teachers, the Buddha, Gandhi, Socrates, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr. These people, like Jesus, had a great understanding of the divine will, mm -hmm. true virtue and morality. They also followed what they knew to be religious, righteous, and correct, no matter the earthly consequences. Jesus shows us an example of discipleship, living out his beliefs, just as Gandhi and Mother Teresa are disciples of their faiths. They all show us a way of living and aspiring to be in line with the divine and in line with the holy. But now the crux. What is the cost of discipleship? Jesus challenged us by often speaking in parables and exaggeration throughout the gospel. Don't say goodbye. Don't attend the funeral. Just come and follow me. Jesus is using extreme illustrations to show us how hard the path of discipleship is. The reality is, all of our commitments, everything in our life, needs to be weighed and decided upon. And the commitment to faith must be paramount. Possibly unto some difficulty and discomfort. It's a hard request. Stand, stick to our morals, even if it starts to get hard. Did Gandhi stop teaching people to love each other when he received death threats? No, he kept on preaching love. Did Dr. King cease and desist when American culture bade him to? No, he kept on dreaming equality. Did Mother Teresa drive a 
pushy luxury SUV from her contract <laughs> to the needy people. No. no. She gave up her belongings and lived a simple life of love, honesty, and integrity. And Jesus still preached the good news of a kingdom of love even as he was oppressed, mocked, and arrested. And to further show us what it means to be a disciple. These people weren't only religious at church. Can you imagine where our country would be if Martin Luther King Jr. didn't live his faith? Or if Jesus only went to services on the Sabbath and nothing more? We must live our faith outside of these hallowed walls. There should be no separation between our lives in church and our lives outside of church. What we believe has to instruct our lives everywhere. Our actions, a reflection of our beliefs, and a commitment to such beliefs. Too many people act one way in church and a very different way outside when it's not Sunday. Martin Luther King Jr. gave an example that no matter the risk, we must always, always speak up against injustice. Socrates held fast to truth and did not waver in his quest for knowledge, even when persecuted and imprisoned. Mother Teresa showed us that no sacrifice is too large in this life to help those less fortunate. Mahatma Gandhi demonstrated that even when faced with violence, there is no reason to respond in kind. Jesus of Nazareth proved that even until the most terrible and horrible torture and death imaginable, he would embrace a life of love rather than of hate. So what does that mean for us? How do we live our faith in the world? Part of Cobb's social justice focus means that as a community, we are aware of and respond to government decisions. There are two examples this morning. Rebecca called us to action, prayer, and support for the Ann Arbor Concerned Citizens for Justice. When our local or national government makes decisions against our values, we must react. And conversely, when decisions are made in line with our values, we must show our support and celebrate. Last Wednesday, the Supreme Court made a landmark ruling that the Defense of Marriage Act was unconstitutional. Over 30 members of this church celebrated in downtown Ann Arbor, showing our faith and our support of marriage equality. This decision was a great day on the path to equal rights for all of us. But these two examples bring to mind a question. How do we know what is holy, what is righteous, what is in line with the divine will? As I can assure you, there will be people living out their own faith who are not in agreement with us. At the celebration last week, Marriage Equality, State Representative Jeff Irwin said something which spoke to his and our religion. First he thanked all the faith communities who had come out, and then he said something very challenging. He said that no Bible, no Quran, no Torah, no Holy Scripture anywhere supersedes the Constitution of the United States of America. <laughs> I, this makes sense for a state representative to say, for a minister? <laughs> I, I do not agree with that at all, actually. Where did the Constitution come from? It came from the deep faith of those right. who composed it. Right. Many of those involved with the writing of the Constitution were deeply religious men, yes, they were all men, and their faith informed their decisions and made that document what it is today. Now, in line with this statement, sentiment, I have a, I have a confession to make to all of you. There are two things which I don't believe in, which may come as a surprise. I don't believe in separation of church and state, and I don't believe in atheists. <laughs> I'm serious. 
Now, I'll explain this a little bit. I'm not saying that our government should be based on one religious system or creed. That's not what I mean when I say I don't believe in separation of church and state. I'm saying that there is no way to separate our faith from our decisions. When I vote, I make a decision based on my religious and spiritual beliefs. There is no way I can separate my faith from my politics. We can have religious freedom, plurality, and no state-sanctioned faith, but separation of church and state cannot exist. I personally hope and pray that our elected officials are informed by their respective faiths. Now, onto atheists, which I also do not believe in. <laughs> I know there are people who don't think they believe in God. I'm being very challenging here. But I think it's a definitional difference rather than a faith deficiency. The term atheism implies that nothing is of utmost importance. I would challenge them and say that everyone holds something as most holy. Everyone worships something. Even if it isn't labeled God, we all hold some ideal, some belief, or some system as the most essential and valuable. And that ideal, that belief, is what we are worshiping. So I challenge people, and maybe you can do it if you, if you agree, challenge people you know who label themselves as atheists to look at what they hold most dear and recognize it as such. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean that Jesus tells us to drop everything that we're doing and follow him? It means that we need to recognize our faith and live it out and live it proud. If I proclaim the divine as the spirit of love and the connection between us, that should show through my life and how I live. And I don't mean only in large national social justice issues. This goes for our everyday actions also. What does your faith require of you when you drive? If you're out walking the dog. Does your faith say anything about how you interact with strangers you encounter? Or about how you use electronic communication? When someone stops you on the street and asks for money, how do you live out Jesus' call to give to everyone who asks you? And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. <laughs> and when you are feeling overwhelmed and tired, how do you respond to Jesus saying, Come to me, all of you who are tired and have heavy loads, and I will give you rest. This is the crux of all faith. Don't get me wrong, I find it very interesting to talk about theology and different beliefs. I enjoy these conversations about people's beliefs in the unknown. But even more important, even more interesting is talking about how people live their faith. Oh, you believe in Jesus as the Christ. What does that mean in your daily life? How do you embody that? Oh, you're a non-theistic neo-pagan druid. <laughs> that's, that's great. How does that inform how you live? How about this quote? Arguably attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. <laughs> Preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. We need words and explanation, but our actions speak volumes. If I pulled up to church in a gas guzzling SUV, it wouldn't matter what I said about stewardship of money and resources. If I start spreading rumors and say gossip is well unloving, it will be very hard to hear the Spirit through me. I'm talking about living out our faith. This is a challenge for all of us, and I'm sorry, I do not have the answers. I have just questions. How do I live? How do we live our lives constantly informed by our faith? What does Jesus say about where we shop? How we drive? the food we eat, the stores we shop at, where we spend our time and money. 
How does our faith come into play when we get cut off in traffic? <laughs> or when the line at the grocery store is longer than expected? <laughs> when we have been out of work for months and are still searching, how does our religion inform us and what we do? Now the great part of this spiritual life discernment, because it's hard, the great part is that we can do it in community. What better place to challenge and support each other and ourselves than in this religious, I know, religious journeys, than at this loving, beloved community of faith. We come together to support and love each other and to recenter ourselves in our shared faith. This is the task of the religious community. So let us feel the support of Cogs as we go out there and live our faith outside. The cost of discipleship is high. It means taking every part of your life and starting and trying to align it with the divine will. But we can do it with our deep faith and with the support and love of religious community. I end with a quote from Reverend Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard. The path is never clear. And the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down, there is another truth. You are not alone. Amen. Amen.